Over the last couple days, we've got another major warning from a key market that sent us the same warning last fall, just when all that stuff began to happen in global markets. At the same time, we've got the IMFs coming out today saying, we're really worried about what could happen this year. Now, the two are just coincidence because the IMF doesn't pay any attention to this key market, though they really should. We won't make that same mistake, and this key market I'm talking about is interest rate swaps, and in particular, interest rate swap spreads, which is the difference between the fixed leg price of the, the quote from the interest rate swap versus the same maturity nominal U.S. Treasury yield. Now, if you're interested, I did a video last fall amidst all that fireworks where I explained the intricacies of these swaps and interest rate swap spreads, how they work, how they're related to collateral. So if you want to check that out, I'll put a link here somewhere or somebody will put a link here. I don't know exactly how it's done, but there will be a link to that video. It's understandable why people have a hard time with interest rate swaps and swap spreads because in many ways, they're counterintuitive, including the idea of a negative swap spread. When the swap spreads first went negative way back in October of 2008, there's a clue for you, many people said, this is impossible. It shouldn't happen because a lower fixed leg part, a fixed leg quote for the interest rate swap seems to suggest the market is thinking the counterparty on the other side of the swap, which happens to be a financial concern, a bank of some sort, is less risky than the U.S. government and U.S. treasuries? No, it's entirely nonsense. A negative swap spread on its face is nonsense. As I wrote almost a decade ago, a negative swap spread makes no literal sense apart from an ill-suited surface convention that the market is viewing the U.S. government as more of a credit risk than a financial, uh, part, private financial counterparty. It takes a huge imbalance to manufacture such gibberish. So much that what is important is not trying to maintain the literal sense of what should be interpretation, but instead to appreciate the dire condition that might force such recognition. If swap spreads aren't making much sense, then we can only conclude that global euro dollar bank balance sheet capacity is severely constrained in the same money dealing activities that deliver broad order, or in this case, disorder, therefore nonsense. So the market warnings we got were last Friday and yesterday, Monday. The five-year swap spread plummeted, plummeted to minus 12 basis points. And the five-year swap spread has been enormously volatile over the last several weeks. It was as high as plus 25 basis points on March 22nd when the FOMC last meet, and plus 25 basis points was the highest for the spread in over a decade. And now here we are at minus 12 basis points, which is one of the lowest on record. It's equal to about, uh, it's equal to September 18th, 2019. If you remember that date, September 18th, 2019, that was the third of the repo rumble back in 2019. So yeah, there's a good comparison for you, but it wasn't just the five-year maturity. The 10-year swap spread fell to minus 14 basis points. That's the lowest since March 19th of 2020. Again, not a good, not a good comparison. And minus 14 is within sight of some of the lowest spreads on record. So the swaps market, not just falling down to low levels, but doing so over the last couple of days in a way that really gets you to say, hmm, this is nonsense, but it's important nonsense because it's telling us about impairment in bank balance sheet capacity. In April, it also tells us, as I mentioned on that video last October, about collateral scarcity and demand and maybe other factors involved with collateral shortages and runs that we've been talking about uh, all too frequently lately because collateral is tied up into these interest rate swaps too, which is why we pay so much attention to them. Bank balance sheet capacity, one of the most fundamental monetary um, aspects that there is, collateral, you hugely important. Those two things colliding, negative swap spreads, huge warning. So pay attention to that as well as, you know, we're still digesting the H8 data, which suggests banks in the United States at the very least are acting on the lessons of Bear Stearns. And here we have the swap market, which is broader than just the U.S. banking system, global financial system, indicating the same thing for the same reasons. 
So we've got more swaps to talk about what the what the major warning means. Got a got a cameo from Mr. Emil Kalinowski, at least in his chart, as well as what is it the IMF is absolutely de almost deathly afraid of to a certain degree. All that is next, but first, I'm Jeff. This is Euro Dollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. I do appreciate it. If you're interested, Eurodollar University memberships are available at our website where we go into the background monetary details behind this Eurodollar system and what all of these things actually mean. I'm just putting together more parts of our basic series where we can start with the foundational aspects of the monetary, not just the monetary system in the Eurodollar sense, but also money in general. I've also got research subscriptions, a daily briefing I do in partnership at marketsinsiderpro.com. Check that out. Uh, part of a bundle there, Stephen Van Meter, Tracy Schuchart, and I do a daily deep dive analysis where we dive deep into all of these things, not just interest rate swaps, not just the IMF, but everything that's related to them, curves and how curves are changing. All the information you need is available at eurodollar.university. Interest rate swaps are sending a warning, and really, the more nonsensical, the more the, the swap spread compresses and becomes even more negative, the more you know things are going wrong. My old Eurodollar University co-host, the co-host emeritus, Emil Kalinowski, sent me a chart not, re not too long ago, before the swaps warning, basically saying, hey, watch out for this, uh, where he compared these interest rate swap spreads with the stock markets, particularly bank stocks. And lo and behold, what he found was, surprising to me, because... You know, I don't put much stock in stock prices. Maybe I should reconsider that. But he measured the relative value of the Dow Jones Banking Index with Dow Jones Industrial, I think it's Industrial, Dow Jones stocks in general. So the relative sense in the stock market or equity market about valuations and conditions in banking versus the overall stock condition. And what he, what he found was a, near, a really good close correlation between the behavior in the swaps market, swap spreads, and these relative perceptions of bank stocks or bank sector stocks, which which makes sense because those are both reacting to the same thing. Swap spreads are being driven by illiquidity and the types of factors that would depress banking, therefore banking, banking results and banking values. And then stock market investors reacting to those same things and saying, yeah, we're going to value banks a little bit less than other equities. So again, swaps are deeply fundamental about really basic important characteristics in the global monetary system not just banks not just individual banks not just regional banks but really the way the monetary system and the banking system connect together with finance and economy in the euro dollar sense so i highly you know i recommend that you follow emil on twitter because there's always something witty in, he's always got something witty and, and worthwhile uh in his twitter feed as we have these swap market warnings, these spreads, we've got other things too. I mean, the yield curves, we've talked about that endlessly. Today, the IMF comes out with its WEO update, which is the World Economic Outlook for April. And they downgraded their economic numbers for this year a tiny little bit, but they upgraded their economic forecast for advanced economies, in particular the United States and Europe, on the idea that January and February payrolls were representative of a resilient economy. Now you can tell what happened here. They looked at all that data in January and some of it in February and said, hey, the US economy, the European economy for some of the stuff over there, they seem to be holding up really well in the face of all this inflation stuff. And now inflation is falling off a little bit, maybe it's coming back, but these economies, especially labor markets are really holding up well. So they began to run these simulations with tight, with uh, tighter and more resilient and robust labor markets, and they started to forecast rising numbers for this year and next year. And they did this likely from the early part of March, and then something happened in March that didn't give them enough time to maybe run enough simulations to recalculate what would have what what what, what the risks actually are after mid March. So the world, the, the WEO numbers that they put out are mostly about, hey, resilient labor markets, maybe China reopening is helping, is going to help the global economy. And then mid-March happens and it's like, uh-oh, 
We don't have tough, enough time to rerun the numbers, but we'll just, we'll add some sections to the WEO text and we'll run some minor simulations. We'll call it a plausible alternative scenario and tell everybody we're really worried about these downside risks, even though we're, we're upgrading advanced economy numbers. So by the numbers, the April uh, uh, world GDP growth in 2023, they expect it to be 2.8, that's down a little bit. 3.0% uh, for next year. Those are really weak numbers for global GDP. So the economy, as they're admitting, much less than they thought back in 2021 when they, when they said and projected that 2021 would represent a real robust recovery. That stuff is long gone nowadays. They upgraded the U.S. GDP for this year to 1.6%. That's two-tenths of a percent higher than in January and six-tenths of a percent higher from last October when they were convinced inflation was going to continue to plague everything. So already got that wrong. Even so, they're projecting only 1.1% GDP growth in 2024, largely because they, effect, they expect Federal Reserve rate hikes to depress economic growth. Yeah, these models. Europe, they see is 0.8% this year, 1.4% next year. Those are both up from recent estimates. Um, again, same idea. The European economy seems to be hanging in there, plus lower energy prices. Maybe things are going to go well for Europe. Not great, but not horrible either. China, a 5.2% expectation for this year, only 4.5% next year. But the 5.2 is eight tenths of a percent higher than last October because of reopening. And the IMF thinks that reopening will at least provide a temporary boost to China, and maybe the rest of the global economy too. But with all that, won't call it good news or optimism, but positivity, at least compared to previous estimates, the IMF made sure, when you read the, the WEO text, the report they put together, they made sure repeatedly to point out that the downside risks are far, far, far greater than they were in January. Let me just read you one passage. Risks to the outlook are squarely to the downside. Much uncertainty clouds the short and medium term outlook as the global economy adjusts to the shocks of 2020 and 2022 and the recent financial sector turmoil. Mm. Recession concerns have gained prominence while worries about stubbornly high inflation persist. Well, they persist in central banks, not in any real sense. There is a significant risk that the recent banking system turbulence will result in a sharper and more persistent tightening of global financial conditions than anticipated in the baseline of plausible alternative scenarios, which would further deteriorate business and consumer confidence basically the 2008 style scenario, where back then everyone, not just the IMF, but all economists and central bankers looked at the housing problem, the subprime mortgage problem and said, well, this might depress outlook if it goes further than we expect it to. And then it went not just further, it went way further. So you can tell, you can tell here in the language, the IMF is a little bit careful. Yeah, this, this could go worse than maybe we're expecting. Um, as they said, continuing here, financial sector stress could amplify and contagion could take hold, weakening the real economy through a sharp deterioration in financing conditions and compelling central banks to reconsider their policy paths. Basically, exactly what market curves have been pricing all along. And by the way, central banks being uh, reconsidering their policy paths, that's already happened. Australia and India, two, two recent examples last week, in particular large, large economy central banks that have said basically the same thing as the IMF just did. We're a little bit concerned about this financial turmoil. Let's not financial turmoil. Let's monetary turmoil. Let's go to, I mean, Pierre Oliver Gorinches, the IMF's chief economist, said below the surface turbulence is building and the situation is quite fragile. Again, markets, they've been telling you us that. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's the thing that they always get wrong. Maybe they're finally starting to learn about this whole monetary system. We can all remember the long time between the failure of indivi an individual institution, whether it was Bear Stearns or Countrywide. Every time this was treated like an isolated incident until it wasn't. Yeah, because they weren't isolated incidences. In the way economics looks at the banking system is as banks are individual islands, almost like national economies. They treat them as individual islands when they're massively interconnected. 
And so when Bear Stearns failed, they thought, well, or nearly failed, sorry, it merged. They thought, well, that was an isolated case. And throughout history, you can say, you know, okay, yes, these banks have failed because of their own problems, which is what we're, we're, what we're told or being, we're being uh, told to think about Silicon Valley Bank and even Credit Suisse to an extent. That Silicon Valley Bank failed because of its own bank failure properties, its, its own stupidity. Um, but that's no, that's not what happened with Bear Stearns. It's not what happened with Countrywide. It's not what happened with SVB or Credit Suisse. These are not isolated incidences. And it's those are symptoms, as I said, of the global monetary tide receding. And we know the tide is receding because we have these markets, we have these indications to tell us this. So SVB wasn't an isolated incident. Credit Suisse was an isolated incident. I just talked about the swaps market, this deeply fundamental market that is already in a seriously bad position, spreads decompressed, or compressed, excuse me, and they're getting worse, not better. So yes, this is these bank failures are symptoms of the real problem. The bank failures are not the problem, they're just symptoms. And if the problem is as bad as market curves are projecting, then you can see why the IMF is suddenly very careful about saying downside risk, downside risk, downside risk. Even when they put together this plausible alternative path, which suggests some additional tightening in financial conditions because of recent bank turmoil, it doesn't really change their numbers much. These models, these DSGE models, aren't meant to be changed all that much. It really takes a huge shock in order to get them to actually, pre or actually predict something like that. But even this alternative scenario, um, in our plausible alternative scenario with further financial sector stress, not huge stress, but some financial stress, stress global growth declines to about 2.5% in 2023, which is the weakest since the global downturn of 2001, not including uh, the COVID crisis in 2020 or the financial crisis in 2009, which wasn't a financial crisis, with advanced economy growth falling below 1%. And as they just said, there is a chance, even in their their understanding of things that this all this plausible alternative scenario might actually prove to be optimistic if these individual bank failures are not actually individual bank failures and part of this plausible alternative scenario makes the same mistakes as the policymakers made in 2008 by assuming that this the, the scenario assumes that monetary policy responds to the resulting decline in economic activity and inflationary pressures with policy rates lower than in the baseline regarding fiscal policy it is assumed the automatic stabilizers operate but there is no additional legislated stimulus in other words like 2007 and 2008 as the economy be, as financial conditions tighten far more than they expect these economists believe, well, central banks are going to reverse course and they're going to start to cut rates. And that's going to be a positive contribution. It's going to limit the downside, at least in these econometric models. In reality, we know it doesn't. We know that these, these rate cuts don't do anything. These stimulus measures, the toolkit, they always have to come up with new tools because they're ineffective. So the markets are telling you, the IMF is even telling you, there's a systemic, potentially systemic issue. Well, they say it's potentially systemic issues. We know it's more than potential here. We can see it in these marketplaces because the potential downside, which they didn't think was there just a couple months ago, actually is there. And that's the last point here. They're just now coming, they're just now realizing this, is, this has been, this is an actual problem here. The tide of money is receding. These individual bank problems are not individual problems. They are indeed systemic. And even the IMF is afraid that might be the case. I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, huge thank you, Eurodollar University subscribers, Markets Insider Pro Research subscribers, Eurodollar University members. Shout out to all of you. And until next time, take care.